told you we would have a response. Okay, here it comes. But first, let me tell you what we agree with. We agree with the government when they say that on November 25 of 2010, a terrible crime occurred here in Hillsborough County. And we agree with the government when they tell you that Juan and Sergio Dethrone died and that four others were shot. And we agree with the government when they come and tell you that it was wrong and it was criminal. But they say Michael Keatley did it. They say Michael Keatley is responsible. They have picked up the heavy hand of blame and pointed it at Michael Keatley. Folks, that is where our agreement ends. Michael Keatley is not guilty because he did not do it. Now you just heard from Miss Johnson for some time and she told you some facts and, and this is my chance to tell you what we believe the facts will be, okay? And we take issue with some of the things that they mentioned in their opening statement. And we take issue that there are some things that they did not tell you in this opening statement. And for that, I'm grateful for a response. We went last week, a long time in jury selection, and when we did, we talked to you about this idea of presumed innocent. That when you sit here, you are presumed innocent. But at some point it was suggested until, uh-uh, unless the government proves its case beyond to the exclusion of each and every reasonable doubt. Remember how we talked about the father who presumes that his son or his daughter did something without seeing? And that we said, we don't want to presume guilt in any situation. It's not fair to start here at this table. Remember how we said as a father or a parent that maybe we'll stand Judge, here in the middle. I'm yes. going to object this to argument your opening statements. I'm going to caution uh, Mr. Grant not to argue the case. Save it for closing. Let's talk about oh, yeah. what you believe the facts will be in the case. As you hear the evidence, you don't stand in the middle. As you hear the evidence, you are to presume that he is innocent. And Michael Keatley is here today to let each and every one of you know that he is not guilty of what these prosecutors say he is. So let's get to work. When we talk about this case, the government will have to prove their case beyond and to the exclusion of each and every reasonable doubt. As you have heard already in jury selection, a reasonable doubt can come from a lack of evidence, a conflict in the evidence, and the evidence itself. When you hear the testimony today, you and throughout the time we're together, you can and you should consider what's missing, what conflicts, and what you hear. And as you do, the courtroom will fill with reasonable doubt, even though it only takes one doubt. That is reasonable. In bringing these charges, the government has the obligation to prove every element of their crimes. Michael Keatley has to prove nothing, but we have stuff to say. Michael Keatley stands here ready to face what they bring. Judge, they have to prove. Just to argument, Mr. Opening Statements. Uh, I'm going to stay at this point. Um, Mr. Grant, let's move on to what you believe the evidence will show. Let's right. avoid any argument the, the in the opening statement. Sure. Sorry, Judge. The evidence will show that they have to prove every element of the case, and they have to do it beyond a reasonable doubt. So before we get to Thanksgiving morning of 2010, we have to go back in time. 
the prosecutor argued that this is a case of obsession <clears throat> about vengeance and revenge. We need to tell you about January 23rd of 2010. For while they said it's evidence of his motivation to commit a terrible crime, in reality the evidence will show irrefutably that he could not do what they've accused. On that day, Michael Keatley, as he had many times before, drove his purple ice cream truck throughout Ruskin, throughout Waimama, throughout Old Sun City Center. Michael Keatley was known. Michael Keatley was known. That Ocean Mist address, he'd been up and down and around that many a time. On this January 23rd, what happened was someone flagged him down, a woman, and he stopped. Do you want ice cream? Do you want nachos? She wanted his money. And she had two people to help him get it. They did not tell you that the people who put a gun to him were wearing ski masks. And they did not tell you that all he could see was their eyes. They wanted everything. They gave him everything. All $12. And then they shot him. And then they shot him again. And then they shot him again. And then they shot him again. I don't think it's even possible to explain or understand how Michael Keatley was able to get to that driving, uh, in the driver's Objection, seat. Judge well, um, Mr. Grant, re rephrase. <laughs> Fine. I don't think the facts will show exactly how he got in that driver's seat and was able to drive himself to safety but somehow he did, and somehow he got help. And somehow he got taken to Tampa General <clears throat> Hospital. Michael Keatley arrived with shots to his leg, chest, shoulder, and hand. No one wants to be in the condition that Michael Keatley was on January 23rd. But if you are, you want to have David Halpern on call. David Halpern is the chief, the chief of plastic surgery for Tampa General Hospital. David Halpern was on call. David Halpern operated on Michael Keaton on January 24. David Halper has a specialty in the area of the hand. And what the prosecutors did not tell you was the extent of the injuries. David Halper is going to come before you on March 14. And Ms. Khan is going to ask him questions. And Ms. Khan will help guide Dr. Halpern to educate you on what was going on with Michael Keaton. What his condition was. Specifically and especially as it related to the hand. It's important for you to know that as a result of what happened to him on January 23rd of 2010, Michael Keatley was left with a pronounced limp. And the hand? They're going to use a word called comminuted fracture. Basically, that means when the bullet goes in, it just doesn't break in one or two places. 
It is the worst kind of injury. Sometimes you can't even put the bone back together again. And there are nerves that are attached. And Michael Keatley went through his first surgery on January 24, 2010. It would not be the last. He would have surgery again in March. He would have surgery again in June. You're going to hear a phrase called radial nerve palsy. And that simply means Michael Keatley's radial nerve, which goes from your shoulder, through your arm, down to your hand, to your fingers and your thumbs, it wasn't working properly. That's what you're going to hear. And that really the only thing that could be done was to see if there would be some response over time. The radial nerve, as Dr. Halpern will tell you, is the only nerve that allows us to extend our wrist, our fingers, and our thumb. Without the radial nerve functioning properly, the person cannot extend their wrist. Without the radial nerve functioning properly, a person cannot extend their fingers. And without the radial nerve functioning properly, a person cannot extend their thumb. The question will be asked. Dr. Halpert, was the injury to Michael Keatley's hand significant? This will be the answer. It was majorly significant. It was majorly significant. So what does this mean? Dr. Halpern will tell you that what this means is that he did not have function to be able to do this. He could not. The only thing that could be done were some exercises to try to see if he would get some um, use, but that was over time. Here's a picture that Dr. Halpern will give you. He will say if when someone goes into a room and turns on the light switch and the electricity doesn't go and the light doesn't turn on, that can be frustrating if you're entering a room. It can be very frustrating when it's your hand. The light switch will flick, but nothing would respond. Every three months, Michael Keatley would go for a test. A big fancy word will be used. EMG, I'm gonna give you the letters because I have a hard time pronouncing it. It's a test that cannot be faked. It's a test that cannot be cheated. It cannot be gamed. Michael Keatley would have electronic stimulus put on his hand <coughs> and his arm and they would see if there was any response. <coughs> the last test done on Michael Keatley, November of 2010, November 1. The results, no recovery, no improvement since the last one in June. The switch is being flicked, but electricity is not going through and the light is not going on. And that's Michael Keith. Medically. And let's talk about what you'll hear practically. When Michael Keatley got out of the hospital in 2010, his life had changed. He could no longer live on his own. He moved in with his parents. 
He slept in a hospital bed. He wore Velcro shoes because he could not tie his shoes. He could not cut his meat. He could not always wipe himself. This is Michael Keaton. In order for Michael Keatley to do anything, <coughs> he has to think about it. Brushing his teeth requires thought and planning. Things that are taken for granted do not happen. Now, I'm going to tell you, There'll be a couple of people probably come in, a couple of ex-girlfriends. They'll say, ah, you know, we didn't really notice anything. And David Beckwith and Wesley Smith, you've heard about one, and you'll meet the other. Yeah, he was shooting guns. They'll say, everything was fine. directly conflicting the medical testimony. Hear me, please, and hear me clearly. Dr. Halpern has not gotten a check. Dr. Halpern is not paid. Judge, I'm going to object this to argument. <coughs> I'll sustain. Mr. Grant, avoid argument. Just talk about the facts. The evidence will show that Dr. Halpern was the treating doctor of Michael Keaton not looking over anybody else's work. And he will refute them over and again. Because see, the right hand and the left hand have to work together. He cannot do things separately and independently. That's what Dr. Halpern will tell you. In order to do this, he first must do this. And when he's got his hand open, he now must, well, I'll move it over here, he now must do this. That's Michael Keatley in 2010. The hand is not his only disability. All of this is going to be important for you <coughs> because you're going to have to realize that medically, irrefutably, the evidence will show that his movements are slow. They are deliberate. They are awkward. They are uncoordinated. Spoiler alert, like nothing any of these people on the porch will describe. That's Michael Keatley. And furthermore, Michael Keatley had been in that neighborhood. So this is our defense. Michael Keatley is not guilty because he did not do it. He did not do it. He could not do it. He is not medically capable. So now let's talk a little bit as, as, as the calendar has turned and January becomes February. And Michael Keatley uh, is a motivated victim. There's no question about that. I expect that we'll talk to Detective <coughs> Nolan, and when we asked Detective Nolan, he wanted to know who did this. He was shot. He was left for dead. He called, and he called. And you know what? What they told you the evidence will be is not correct. Michael Keatley described the people who did this as black, dark complected. The prosecutor, excuse me, not the prosecutor, the, the detective 
never once considered that Hispanics can be dark complected or light complected. And when Mr. Keatley called them, he was saying the word on the street is that this was Hispanics who did this. Ruskin, Waimama, Old Sun City Center has a heavy Hispanic population. Michael Keatley never once backed off of his identification. He said, this is what I'm hearing out there. Will you please go check it out? And without question, you will learn that Michael Keatley wanted to have the person who did this to him caught, not killed. Crime Stoppers was involved. Rewards were offered. He put it on his truck as he drove throughout Ruskin. Do you know? Have you heard? What have you seen? That will be the evidence. He was motivated. He was interested. And when he heard something, he called. And when he called, they did nothing. Nothing. He gave them names. He gave them anything and everything he had. And you know what they said? Stop interfering, sir. Let us do our work, sir. And to some extent, as the evidence will come out, and we'll ask Detective Nolan, the reason why you do that is you don't want to pollute a victim or a witness. You saw what you saw. Let's not use word on the street. Let's not use something that could contaminate you. To a certain extent, we can understand that. They told you that Michael Keatley was angry. <clears throat> they did not tell you the whole truth. Yes, Michael Keatley, the evidence will show, is that guy. You want to buy a nacho? Have you heard who shot me? He was preoccupied with that. There's going to be no question. They'll put a TV story on it where he says, I want the people who did this to me to suffer like I did. He'll say that. And he'll even say in a statement with Detective Shram. We'll <clears throat> talk about him. Detective Shram, you know what he says? I went through that. I processed that. That's in the rearview mirror. You may hear from a guy named Luciano Alonso. He's got a restaurant. Michael Keatley eats there. They talked. Nobody ever called. No evidence will be brought to say he's out there threatening people. If they produce someone by the name of Armando Guerra, listen very closely because Armando Guerra will say, if he testifies, that Michael Keatley said I was involved with the shooting. Do you know what Michael Keatley did? He held out his wrist. He held out his hand. He said, it doesn't work anymore. This is what happened to me. Not once will there be a threat. Not once will there be a weapon. Because you know what the evidence is? Michael Keatley is Ruskin. Michael Keatley is why mama. And the state's own witnesses will tell you that the people of Ruskin were fond of Michael Keatley, and Michael Keatley was fond of the people of Ruskin. You want to run a tab? Okay. You want to pay me back slowly? If at all? Okay. Over and again, Michael Keatley had involved himself in the community. That's the evidence. He was there all the time. That is very significant to this case. Oh, and by the way, you know what one of the other emotions he expressed was? I thought I was going to die, but I feel like God gave me a second Objection, chance. Objection, Judge. Approved.
Lee. He was talking with Norma Towers. He thought that he'd been given a second chance by God. If they're going to bring in evidence in this case that suggests that it was all anger all the time, that is not correct. And we will confront that. They talk to you about Creeper. And they talk to you about that being Omar Bailon. Never once was the name Juan Gatron and never once will there be any evidence that Juan Gatron was a part of what happened to Michael Keatley in January of 2010. No evidence of Sergio Gatron being involved, or Daniel Beltran, or Gonzalo Guevara, or Jose Rodriguez, or Ramon Galan, or Richard Cantu. Never once had their names or any nicknames, Gonzalo goes by Gonzo, for example, hadn't come up. And so now we can talk about actually Thanksgiving of 2010. And let's make something very clear. These people are victims. And what happened was awful. Two are dead. One cannot speak for himself. Three will testify in person. One will come by video. And I want to let you know, we will have to ask them questions. When all is said and done that night on the porch, hanging out, playing cards, drinking beer. Somewhere between 50 to 60 beers are consumed. Several marijuana blunts are smoked. Someone goes out and gets cocaine and some of them take bumps or hits off of cocaine. And that's the evidence. And by the way, when we talk to you about them, please, that is not to say we don't like them and neither should you. Not at all. You have to be put in their place to gauge their perception. And that's why we will talk with them. And that's why we will show them and every witness respect. But there are questions that need to be asked and they will be answered. <coughs> And here is what we have. Two people are going to come in. I say come in, one by video and one in person. Two people are going to come in and they are going to say, Michael Keatley is the one who shot me. That's what they're going to say. Objection, Judge? Are you approached? Absolutely. As I mentioned, two people will come in here and identify Michael Keaton. 
Jose Rodriguez will testify by video replay and say Michael Keatley was the shooter. Gonzalo Guevara will come in here and say Michael Keatley is the shooter. So it seems like there's really nothing to question. I want you to anticipate testimony from Dr. Jennifer Dysert. She will be called by the defense. Like Dr. Halpern, she is very skilled. She is very credentialed in her field. And she deals with the issues of identification that people make. Dr. Dicer will testify about a couple of things. One, she will testify about something called estimator variables. And these are factors related to the witness and their opportunity to see a perpetrator at the time of a crime and to make a correct identification. When you hear from her, you may want to have your notepad ready. I can't obviously tell you what to do, but there are certain factors that she will talk about. One, she will talk about duration. The time to see the events. In other words, as she will say, the more you see, the more you can be accurate. Now, when Ms. Johnson talked to you, she blended the statements together into a narrative that is cohesive. But that's not how it worked. We're gonna step witness by witness very quickly. And in fact, there is conflict in their statements and testimony that you will hear. To some extent, that can be expected. Now, what everyone will agree on is that this was a quick event. It happened fast. And it happened in seconds. <clears throat> we'll talk about this so much. You may think, man, this is an event that took as long as jury selection, but that's just not true. It was quick and it was dark. That's the second thing that you will hear. Not only is there duration, but there's exposure. The ability the, to see the events. And not only was it quick, it was dark. The evidence will be that there is no street light in front of Ocean Mist. There was only one small porch light. A shadow comes, a shadow shoots, a shadow goes. Dr. Dysert will ask you to consider weapon focus. Was the witness focusing on the gun? Again, there will be conflict in how this shooting occurred. For example, Gonzalo Guevara will say a first shot was done in the air, while Ramon Galan will say, no, that first shot hit me. But on this, almost all agree that a black pump action shotgun was used. A black pump action shotgun. Black pump action shotgun. That's what was used. Daniel Beltran and Jose Rodriguez should tell you that after each shot, the shooter had to rack and shoot. Rack and shoot using two hands. Dr. Dyser will ask you to look at stress and high arousal, the ability to see something sudden to encode it and process it, not only process it, to accurately store it so that when you tell it again in the future, you are actually telling something correctly. She will talk about own group or own race bias. It's not a uh, pejorative, it's not racist. It's that certain people in certain groups are easily able to identify within their own group. It could be age. It could be color. You have cross-race identification in this case in that they claim it was a white person who did it. Alcohol and intoxication. It should be obvious, but Dr. Dysert will talk to you about that. 
that can have the ability to affect someone. And the issue, lastly, is going to be on prior familiarity. Hold your ticket stub for a minute. We'll come back to that. I want to talk to you quickly about these witnesses. Ramon Galan started the night at his cousin's house, hanging out with his cousin Rosemary. Juan Gatron was there. Richard Cantu was there. Richard Cantu was driving. Ramon probably had four or five beers there at some point in time. They leave Rosemary's. They go to a gas station. They get a 12-pack of beer, and they come over to Ocean Mist. Ocean Mist is a dark street. The lighting is, as Mr. Galone will tell you, just a porch light. Where the porch light was lit up, but like the road and the yard, it's dark. After a while, they decided they were going to go back to Rosemary's. So Ramon Galan is on the step. see the jury. I don't need to see the, the yes, screen. I'm trying, That's to see, I'm trying to see the screen. <laughs> we're going to show you we're going to show you the step in just a, a second. But as you do, to be good with your time, Ramon Galan is at the bottom on the first step. He, all of a sudden, hears somebody. He's going to be right about here. And for the record, I'm pointing at the bottom first step on the right as you're facing the picture. Everybody else is up on the porch. He's waiting for Juan. He's waiting for uh, Richard so that they can go back to Rosemary. And at some point in time, up comes a person who says, give me your, uh, give me your ID. Uh, try that again. Give me your IDs. He turns and he is shot. That's the first shot. It was one to two seconds. He could not tell ethnicity. He will not be able to tell voice, height, weight. It's a silhouette. Doesn't know anything. He just remembers being asteroids ID, nothing about Creeper, and being shot. That's Ramon Galan. Daniel Beltran will arrive at this place, Ocean Mist, around 7 o'clock. He's with his buddy Diego Lucas. Diego Lucas is not on the porch when this happens. Diego Lucas is going to be inside this house. There are people inside this house who are asleep. None of them see anything. They may hear some stuff, but they're not eyewitnesses to what happened. He's not sure how cocaine gets introduced on the porch, but he's going to use it. He smoked marijuana. He drank beer. He's going to say that he saw a minivan. And despite what Ramon Galan says, apparently they all talk about it. Hey, there's a minivan. Drive. The car leaves and then comes back and now it parks somewhere in front. And by the way, this does not give you a great idea of the situation because this is lit up by sheriff lights. This is dark. And this is not many feet from the road. It is very close to the road. Daniel Beltran will say that the shooter was between six foot one and six foot two inches. That the shooter was wearing black boots that were laced up. That the shooter was 250 to 280 pounds. A big guy. That's who the shooter is. Daniel Beltran was facing the house when this started because when he says he was told to get down on his knees, he did and he faced away. And the shooting was loud and the shooting was quick. 
He describes a pump action shotgun, black, knows it for a fact, holding the gun with both hands. The trigger and the stock is in his right hand. The barrel is in his left. Since it was a pump action, had to shoot and pump between rounds. Everyone but Juan was facing away. He will say that the shooter tried to kick him or others after he was shooting. And yes, he will agree this was just a matter of seconds and that ocean mist is in fact a very dark street. This takes us to Jose Rodriguez. Jose Rodriguez was on the porch, he was not shot. Listen carefully when you see his cross-examination today. He will have to be corrected on several occasions. More than once, he'll have to look at prior statements. He will be the only one to claim that the shooter arrived in a van and was playing loud rap music. The shooter, large, six foot one to six foot two, 250 to 270 pounds. This is happening fast. He will be another one to tell you this. It is undisputed that he was drinking, smoking marijuana, and snorting cocaine. And now we have to tell you more about Jose Rodriguez. This happens around 2.20, a couple minutes after in the morning. The police come. The police talk to him. First, and he will say this both to the prosecutor and on cross-examination to the defense, he, in spite of all of this, has the wherewithal to mislead the police. Listen for it. People are hurt, being airlifted, and he will say, don't know nothing about Creeper. Watch for it, because it will come. And Jose Rodriguez was asked initially, and you know what his response was when they talked about the shooter? I have never seen this man before in my life. I have never seen this man before in my life. Police we'll get a series of photos, including Michael Keatley's picture, and a deputy or other officer not involved in the investigation. He will show him the photographs. Michael Keatley involved in that. And you know what Jose Rodriguez does? Doesn't pick out Michael Keatley. So the evidence will show, drove through that neighborhood, round and round in his purple ice cream truck. Jose Rodriguez had been on that porch just feet away when Michael Keatley stopped. Jose Rodriguez has been on that porch as he's watched his kids buy ice cream, nachos, whatever. Maybe not even always having to pay. Jose Rodriguez on eight to 10 occasions has said, I bought from that guy. I have never seen this man before in my life. So what changes? Well, very shortly after two o'clock in the morning, a text is sent out. This is a text that will change everything. To borrow from James Thurber, this is where confusion will get its foot in the door. This is the guy who shot magic and spider. I don't know what that word is. If anyone sees him, the cops are looking for him. It's the same guy who got shot in OSC, Old Sun City Center. He was the ice cream man back in January. Where did this come from? 
Um, it was forded and 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 forded. I think I can say that that many times. A man named Juan Hernandez, who heard about the shooting, within two hours or so, comes to Ocean Mist. And then he's later going to look on his phone. He gets the text. A cascade of unreliability and suggestiveness begins right here. Because you know what Juan Hernandez does? He goes to Jose Rodriguez. You know that guy? Yeah, it's the ice cream man. He's the shooter. And so now, under that, Michael Keatley did it. The ice cream man. Name the investigation, name the case based on a text. Can I tell you something? Do you want to know where that text originated? Do you? So do I. Police never followed it up. It went through Riverview. It went through Ruskin. It went through my, mo my mama. Can you believe it? It went to Texas. A state witness by the name of Carol Orduno may testify. She got the text. It's going everywhere. Michael Keatley did it. And when Juan Hernandez says, I'm not going to tell you where I got it, the lead detective in this case says, okay. Curious that this text is going out, as the evidence will show, there was no eyewitness. Jose Rodriguez had not given a full statement. Gonzalo Guevara is in the hospital. He will not talk for days. Daniel Beltran, he's in serious condition as well. There are no home cameras or surveillance footage. No one on the porch spoke to law enforcement besides Jose Rodriguez who said, I have never seen that man before in my life. One picture changes his two. So that is why we're going to argue that this is a case of misidentification. And that is why we will cross-examine these people. So let's talk about Gonzalo Guevara. He cuts hair all day. He was on his feet. He doesn't really want to go out, but his friend kept saying, friend kept saying, friend kept, and finally goes, okay. He goes out with Sergio. He goes out with Walter Lucas, again, someone who lives in the house but is not a witness to what happened. He has seen the purple truck frequently. He knows Jose is bought from the purple truck frequently. He would see this in person. He says he didn't really pay attention. And he was on the porch, which I think he estimates anywhere between 40 to 50 feet away. A little bit more than a first down in football. He has a dark minivan showing up, a man getting out, looking nervous. He describes this person as a chunkier dude like him, but a little taller, like way taller than me. Gonzalo Guevara is 5'9", 225. This man is four to five inches taller than him. This man is 280, maybe 290, maybe 300 pounds. To use the words that Gonzalo Guevara has used before, he's got a chunky, fat body. Significantly, Gonzalo Guevara is going to say, this man walked up, oh, by the way, Jose Rodriguez, my bad, I forgot. Do you know what uh, this shooter did? According to Jose uh, Rodriguez, he speed walked. Walked up real quick, walked up real, real slow. No limb, nobody's gonna talk to you at all about any physical disability. Nothing unusual about the hand. No uncoordination. This is a fat, overweight, chunky guy who did this, and he did it quickly. He did it in the dark. That is going to be their evidence. That is gonna be their testimony. <coughs> Gonzalo Guevara has the shooter with the gun in a left hand. 
and a badge-like thing in his right. Significantly, Gonzalo Guevara is going to say the shooter fired a warning shot in the air. And he did it with his right hand. So somehow, that gun will get from the left hand, the badge will be put away, <coughs> and the gun will get in the right hand and it will shoot. That is going to be Gonzalo Guevara's testimony. And let me tell you, when Gonzalo Guevara goes to the hospital, I'm about to say good for him, not good for him, but good for him that he has supportive family. People come, sisters, brothers, the neighborhood is talking. Everything happens so quick. That's what Gonzalo Guevara will say when he has a chance to speak. No physical disability. Just overweight. Just not in shape. Had brown, orange hair. Prescription cone glasses. Had the black pump action shotgun. He's going to describe some type of vest being worn. As you hear the evidence, in this case, I'm going to ask you to wait again for Dr. Halpern. The evidence will show Michael Keatley does not have the speed, agility, dexterity, or coordination to do what their victims say was done. Let's also talk about Gonzalo Guevara. This is something significant. In jury selection, we talked about rules. We talked about procedures. You're not going to be surprised to hear that Hillsborough County Sheriff, they have rules. They have procedures. They have standard operating procedures. <clears throat> this is going to be significant. How do you do an eyewitness procedure? I want you to keep in mind that what happened with Jose Rodriguez originally was blind administration. An independent administrator administered a test not knowing the desired answer. This person would not be aware which person in the photos or lineup is a suspect and would eliminate the possibility of unintentionally or intention or possibility of unintentionally influencing the witness's selection. The guidelines set forth in this standard operating procedure will be used The guidelines will be used, or shall be used, under various circumstances when dealing with eyewitnesses. <clears throat> eyewitnesses play a vital role in solving crimes, where in some cases, the only evidence that may exist is the testimony of an eyewitness. It is also important to keep in mind that eyewitness testimony may exonerate innocent parties. Procedures surrounding the police lineup have remained unchanged, but research and DNA exonerations have proven that eyewitness ID can be somewhat flawed and should be handled more effectively. It is the intent of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office to seek more reliable procedures for eyewitness identification and ultimately mitigate potential misidentification. That is the rule. Why did I tell you that? Because the lead detective in this case, Jose Lugo, did not follow these rules. He specifically and willfully chose to break policy. And what he's going to say when that text message is already out there He's going to come by the hospital, and he wants to show photographs to Gonzalo Guevara. And the pol and, uh, 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 medical people are going to say, not today. He's, he's hallucinating. And he comes in, and he says, ah, I'm going to come back tomorrow. 
And he, he, he gets all right, show me today. His family's in there. He's like, no, I'm going to show you tomorrow. You remember my name, Jose Lugo. That's what he's going to say. And you know what happens? The next day, they demonstrate a photo array. The next day, they demonstrate a photo array. And now, Gonzalo Guevara is going to say that he is 2,000 percent uh, 2, positive. There's going to be quite a bit of discussion about this right here, this three over a four. So I want you to preview for that, that Gonzalo Guevara originally picked four, then it was changed to three, and the four there. There's a lot of question mark about how this was done. We know it was in violation of the rules. And we know it was done sloppily. What we will also hear from the evidence is it was not recorded. So you cannot see it. You cannot hear it. He identifies Michael Keatley by 2,000%. Even though Michael Keatley has never been anywhere near 300 pounds, anywhere he's, even though he's never been anywhere close to or over six foot two inches. The two eyewitnesses in this case will be based on identification of a man who's been coming through that neighborhood through ye for years. So by now you're not surprised to hear we're going to challenge every bit of the state's evidence. And we will brush away things that will not need to be challenged. Don't be scared. I could stay up here for a lot longer. There's going to be cross-examination. Wesley Smith, he shot on that property. Wesley Smith, there's a lot to say about him because what they say he said, he waited a long time to say. He cannot tell you specifically what. He cannot tell you specifically when. And it was only after he started watching the news and the news and the news and the news. And David Beckwith, they didn't tell you he's a convicted felon who put a gun to Michael Keatley's head, a 45 to Michael Keatley's head, took off with the gun. They told you about painting a van, changing the van. The bumper was two-toned for resale value. They talked to you about a change of a barrel or modification. They will not have one witness come in to say that Michael Keatley ever did that. I'm going to ask you to keep in mind when you hear the government's questions. For Ms. Johnson got up here and talked about computer searches. She says that Michael Keatley made all these searches. The truth is, they cannot show that Michael Keatley ever made one. The truth is, they were selective in what they wanted Michael to be searched. And they cannot even tell you what it means or put it in context. So yes, Michael Keatley, or others use that family computer. And yes, Michael Keatley was interested in finding out who shot him. I have to address something last because they talked about a statement that Michael Keatley made that he denied Creeper. True. He knows Creeper. True. Doesn't he seem like he told the truth? <clears throat> Michael Keatley is Ruskin. Michael Keatley is Old Sun City Center. Michael Keatley is Waimama. And there's a text going around that says he did something he did not do. How do you defend yourself? Because they didn't put it in perspective. They stopped Judge, him. I'm going to object to argument. 
I'll sustain. Mr. Grant, leave it to uh, the facts and not conclusions related to those facts. Here's the evidence. They said that he gave a statement. What they didn't tell you is they pulled him over that night. The police did. On the road for an hour, Detective David Schramm comes up to him, not recorded, and says, hey, let's go back to the sheriff's station. Let's do an interview. We want to talk to you about the case where you were a victim. That's what we want to talk about. He goes there without a phone, without transport. He's taken to the station. They put him in a room. They talk to him about the case. And they say things like, hey, judge me for me. We're not going to BS you. They talk with him a little bit. The first statement ends at the statement, a station, and he goes and sits outside for 45 minutes. No car, no phone. David Schramm sees him, says, I'm going back to your house. I'll give you a ride. On the way back, another discussion is had. And in that other discussion, there are things said by David Schramm. And what are, they, what are they telling him? They start saying, we think you did this. We know you're the one who, did, who committed this crime. They say to him, we've been planning to get a search warrant since 10 o'clock this morning. David Schramm will have to admit that's not true. They say that, or they say, Detective Schramm and his partner, they say, We've got someone who puts you at the scene. That's not true. They say, we're going to take over your case. We're going to find out who did what happened to you. That's not true. They say, we have phone records which put you at the scene of the crime. That is not only not true. Michael Keatley says, terrific. If you've got my cell phone records, you can know where I am. Do it! They never will. They never do. They have the ability, and they do not do it. That is what the evidence will be. Detective Schramm says, we've got somebody who can describe you to a T. However, he does not fit the height, he does not fit the weight, he does not fit the hair color. They even say they've got his actual work glasses that they've recovered. Time and again, the police use what they may call tools or strategic questioning, but what are really intentional misrepresentation and deceptions to get him to say, you did it. And consistently he says, no, I did not. So there's a lot to come. And the time to question witnesses begins now. I'm going to ask you to remind, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to presume Michael Keatley guilt, uh, not guilty, presume him innocent because he's not guilty. I'm going to ask you to listen to the evidence and hear the testimony and because of what is lacking and because of what is conflicting and because of what there is there is only one conclusion that you must draw and that is that Michael Keatley is not guilty of all counts.